There you go. Now you can be seated. So all of you that were not confused or were, now you're not, and you could have been. And this is a full Sunday morning with happy Father's Day and such, but there's also a couple of other pieces and parts going on. In both services, we have a young man speaking to us for a few minutes. You notice I said few minutes. I'm going to give us okay bud back there, you know. You know who's got the microphone last, remember? Don't, don't ever say to a speaker, take your time. He did a great job first service, let's do it again, okay? But Maddox Hughes is, uh, of course, uh, a recent graduate standing up here, senior recognition, been in the youth group forever and ever. As he accounts, he has been a member here at this church forever and ever. But that's under and underneath your mother and father's covering. You're going to have to give us a pint of blood for your new membership. So that'll be... Uh, but at this point right now in his juncture of life, he is headed on something very, very special. And that's a, a summer six-week internship in Honduras. He's going to be with Pastor Jose Valter. Uh, he is, of course, part of the organization uh, Good News in Action, headed up by Steve Kern, missionary, pastor. Uh, he has been here to preach more than once. Steve is also partnered with a man named Julio Contreras. You have, some of you have heard Julio. He is over the El Salvador uh, Central uh, Antioch sending place in San Salvador. He's been pastoring down there for 25 years. And we have had a partnership with that work for 25 years of this church. As far as I, I moved here 25 years ago this year, and I know that we have been involved with Good News in Action. Vida Nueva is the uh, name that they use in Central America as the uh, name of their churches, New Life Church. And so he will be part of a ministry there that we trust implicitly. And that starts up very shortly this Friday. I wanted to have uh, Maddox come and just share with our congregation. He did in first service, as I mentioned, and in second service to just let you know, give you a little background of his testimony and then what God's been doing and what he's looking forward to God doing next in his life. So, without further ado, Maddox Hughes, come speak to us, okay? Hey, y'all. My name's Maddox Hughes, as it, as it says on the slide there. Of course. Um, so yeah, like our beloved pastor said, I'm going to be speaking about my testimony, how I got to this point, and how this opportunity came about, and just a little bit of information about what I'll be doing. So I've been going to this church for as long as I can remember. I, I don't remember a time when I wasn't going to this church. And when I was around four years old, I was diagnosed with a rare form of childhood cancer. And this church kind of just rallied behind me and my family and really supported us in that time. I still have a box in my, in my closet somewhere of little, little coloring sheets and things that that they made over in, over in Faith Place Kids to give to me. And I'm really, I'm really thankful for the support. I mean, I don't have as much memories from that time as, as I'm sure my parents do who are uh, inconspicuously standing in the back recording me. Um, you can introduce them, go ahead. Their names are Morgan Hughes and Andy Hughes. Those are their names. Yes, please. I went on to make a profession of faith at five years old, and from then on, I, I loved the Word of God and I loved evangelism. Those were two of the things that I've, I've loved in my life for, for quite some time. I'd, I'd read the Bible. I, I don't know if you guys have seen the Action Bible. It's like a comic book Bible. It's really cool. That's, that's where my biblical knowledge comes from. Um, <laughs> mostly accurate. Also, I loved evangelism. I'd go to the park to tell the other kids about Jesus. I actually gave away my action Bible one time to this kid. I hope, I hope he read it. 
Uh, I had to get a new one. But yeah, I've and I would tell the cashier at, at Walmart or at the gas station whenever I, whenever I'd go with my mom, I'd I'd say, oh, we have to tell her or we have to tell him about Jesus. And I, of course, our church, First Bible Baptist Church, that's in the name. Uh, this church gave me a love for the Bible, and it's only continued to reinforce that. And of and of course, we're very involved in mission work, both here on the sports field, and and in Salt and Light and various other things, but also overseas. Um, we we've done a mission trip to Honduras, and we're going to do one this year at the end of July. And of course, that only reinforced my love for evangelism. However, I went through a period of of doubt and kind of kind of questioning and leaving my faith uh, starting in eighth grade. That lasted about a year or a little over a year. And I, I luckily, luckily, I don't believe in luck, blessedly, I had a few people in my life who God used to guide me back to the right path. Uh, Josh Bennett, our youth pastor, was a big influence. In, uh, with that for me, as well as Crystal Sanchez, who's also incons inconspicuously sitting in the audience. Um, not, not inconspicuous anymore. Um, very thankful for their uh, long-suffering patience with me and just being there for me and answering any questions even when I was not easy to be patient with. I eventually did come back to the faith. I'm not an atheist anymore, and I would hope you, you figured that out. Um, it, it was a verse, uh, Jeremiah 2.13. I was reading the Bible just because I, you know, it's, it's a really interesting book to read, even, even if you don't believe it. It's kind of wacky in a good way. Um, Jeremiah 2.13 says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out for, them, hewn out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. I left, I'd forsaken God, who was the only one who promised to give me life, and did give me life, and I'd gone after these cisterns that normally would hold stagnant water, which is already gross, but the cisterns themselves are broken. That's, that's the metaphor in that passage. There was no fulfillment to be found in the life that I was trying to pursue, and God used both his word and, uh, and Josh and Crystal, as well as some others, to show me that. And so, great, I'm, I'm back, I, right, I kind of made that decision, rededicated my life to the Lord uh, July of 2020, and of course my love for the Word of God and my love for missions continued. Uh, I got to listen to Steve Kern, who's associated with Good News in Action, he's the director of that ministry that we support. I got to listen to him preach in the 2021 Act 18 conference. He talked about the spiritual crisis facing our world, which is much, much bigger deal than any physical crisis, even though we need to care about those too. And that really captivated me and motivated me to, to want to give my life to missions in some way. Of course, we're all, we're all called to do that. And Brownie mentioned a... a potential offer of a su summer internship in El Salvador, which is where Steve Kern is based. And I was like, oh, that's, that sounds like a cool idea. Maybe, maybe I'll get to do that one day. I was only 16 at the time. Now I'm 18. I've aged and matured so much since then. Um, so now, now I'm ready, definitely. Um, it, it ended up getting switched up to Honduras. I went on a mission trip to Mexico City with Randy Adams, our missions pastor, who's also obviously reinforced my love for missions, and he was able to talk to Steve while he was there about this p potentiality of this uh, summer internship, and it turns out Jose Walter, who Brownie mentioned, is the pastor in Honduras, and he had actually been asking for someone. He'd been asking for help, asking for an intern, and so we decided maybe that would be the better possibility, and that's what we ended up going with. And so that's where I'll be going this summer. I've been, you know, preparing spiritually. I've been meeting with Brownie. We've been going over Nehemiah. It took us about three months to get to, to get through chapter two, um, but we did it. Uh, we are past chapter two now, way past chapter two, so that's good. Um, just learning what it means to be a servant of the Lord, being, being available and willing and prepared, which are things that I'm trying to be. I've been learning Spanish. Um, 
they're probably going to be speaking too fast for me. I might have to throw in a couple mas despacios, um, slow down. Uh, hopefully that works. Randy will be flying with me on June 23rd, which is this Friday, at 5.05 a.m. I'd like to say that's bright and early, but it's probably dark and early. It's probably, probably can't even say that. Um, I got to talk to Jose and his family the other day. They're very excited to have me. I'm very excited to go. I'm really glad God blessed me with this opportunity. Um, it's, not, it's not because I'm, I'm special or anything. Um, it's just God and his grace giving this to me, and I'm, I'm very thankful. I'm also thankful to be able to talk to you and tell, tell you all about this. Uh, I ask that you'll please pray for me as I try to live out the Great Commission, make disciples of all nations, and serve a body of believers in another location in the world. Thank you very much. Great job, Maddox. So, going to Luke chapter number one, and we're going to get back into our study, Make Hope Known. That's kind of a nice little, um, actually an easy statement for me to make in light of what this man just shared about him saying, hey, I'd like to make hope known. I want to tell people about Jesus Christ as I have the last number of years of my life. In my hand are envelopes with a prayer letter from Maddox, okay? I'd like you to make sure and grab one of these. They'll be sitting right up here at the end of service um, after we have our baby dedication, which is coming at the end of service today. And appropriately, we are in Luke chapter number one talking about a birth announcement, so that'll be kind of neat. But this letter here uh, lets you know a little bit of what you just heard, his testimony in uh, ink and paper. It also has at the bottom of it instructions and direction on how to give to support or be part of a one-time gift. We're not going to receive support for, of course, Maddox is not a missionary that can receive support, but rather if you want to be part of our church family or you're outside, the, but you say, hey, I'd love to be part of that and help him out. Well, simply put, again, the directions on how to give her in here on the envelope to make out the check to FBBC and then put a special notation or, of course, to go online and do the same special notation, which would be G-N-I-A Honduras, since that's where he's going and that's where the monies are needed for the expenses. His plane flight is paid for, and, of course, we want to support him in every way, shape, and form that we can to help make sure his expenses are taken care of. And you can imagine if you're going to spend six weeks in Honduras and you're going to pay room and board and all those other things, of course, his personal expenses are on him. If you want to go up and just give him a $100 bill and say, hey, take this and, and turn it into a, one of those Visa cards so that you can spend that on something down there, that's fine if that's what God compels you to do. If you want to give through the church, again, the instructions are in here. You may hear what I said, but you may forget. I know all of you have a great memory, but just in case you happen to forget things once in a while, there are instructions so you can go ahead and grab that letter at the end of service. Just come by and pick one up and uh, go ahead and be part of praying for uh, Maddox as he asked at the end. He could use prayer more than anything else for the next six weeks again and pray for him that he wakes up on Friday morning to be able to catch his flight. Is there such a thing as a normal flight out of this airport ever before 7 o'clock in the morning? Or after 7 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> so thank you, God, for a wonderful airport that's only a few minutes away. 45 minutes away. That's all right. Amen. Very thankful that we can be part of sending this young man off to the mission work that God has called him to. Of course, in uh, first service, we were going hard at it, and I was going to take the time to put my papers together, but I will uh, go ahead and do this while I'm talking to you of the in introduction as we got started last week. Uh, two weeks ago, of course, we were in the introduction, and then last week we got into the first few verses. We looked at chapter number 1, verses uh, 5 through 20. And of course, today we're going to look at uh, verses 26 through 38 and talk about this birth announcement. It says up on the screen there, again, the title of our and the theme of our 
our uh, study, Make Hope Known. When I think about what you and I find as things that we want to have other people know about us, I, I throw this out at you and I throw this out to myself is, hey, do I tell people of the things that I really hope in? Do I tell people about the excite, exciting things in my life that really bring me a reason to wake up in the morning? Something about hope, there's many different aspects to it, but just even in looking at it today, and of course the theme verse is right there at the bottom of that artwork, and it's also in the, the next slide up there, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Immediately when you talk about, as a believer, and where you're at, and hey, Jesus came for me, Jesus has come, and when I got saved, I realized I can tell people that he came to save them as well, immediately that brings something a little bit different to my conversation. It brings something different to my countenance. It's got to light me up to think, boy, you may be in a place where you don't have much hope in the day, much hope in the week, much hope in the month. You may feel hopeless about your finances, your life, and, and you may be in a place, sir or ma'am, that you're talking to where you have no hope. But when you start talking about the hope you have in the Lord Jesus Christ, someone ought to see your countenance lift, your excitement happen. But maybe you're a believer today and you're walking around like this. Your shoulders are hunched and you really have your head down or maybe you're just kind of looking up and you just don't have a whole lot of hope in dot, dot, dot. You're thinking, wow, this is desperate, this is rough, this is hard, sure. But you've maybe lost a sense of the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. That all that's built up in him by your salvation and the finished work that he did on the cross, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves as the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Then I, as you put your faith completely in Jesus Christ and all of that finished work is done and all is what you all of what he has done is what he has put in this all of what he has done for you then you go huh. it's not a game it's not tricking your feelings hope is something that when you have it in the right thing the lord jesus christ it can be a very powerful thing and to make the hope that you have known to other people that that's profound but here we are in the 21st century in 2023 in the summertime and Josh Bennett is thinking God is judging him as the men's softball director and it's hopeless to play softball today. I don't know. We were supposed to have one-tenth of an inch, seven-tenths of rain fell. I don't know. We're going to have to play in a... But no, that's just a fleeting thing. That happens for a few minutes. It's you and I talking to people, looking at other people, and saying, wow, that person has an empty stare in their face. This person has so much they're thinking about and so consumed over life that they walk day after day, week after week, month after month in a place of hopelessness. We have five babies that are going to be dedicated today. Two were not able to be here, so we'll have three at the end of service. We'll do that in a few minutes. Those parents, there's so much hope. When you hold that little baby in your arms, oh, what can my little girl be? What can my little boy be? I sure hope that they fall in love with you, Jesus. I sure hope that they know that you are everything. I hope that they learn that your word is pure, it's perfect. And that they can count on every single word that you've written is personally for them and their purpose for life. I pray, Father God, that all scripture that's given by your inspiration, you, God, is something that they grab a hold of. That when they get saved, they're born again, and they live for you, that they can then go and make hope known because I have all this hope. So what does it mean for you? To make anything or something known, especially the hope 
of your life in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Luke is doing here. Dr. Luke, Gentile Dr. Luke, has this incredible insight into these pregnancies, the announcements, the statement and and clarity of what God's saying through Gabriel the angel. And today, we're going to look at him again and see again the insight by the Holy Spirit, by Luke, of how he says, hey, there's hope coming, hope's coming, hope is coming. And his name is Jesus Christ. He's going to be here soon, let me tell you. Hey, Elizabeth, you're going to have a baby and you're going to have someone. This man, John, he's going to talk about Jesus and the hope. He's the light of the world. But Mary, I'm coming to you, oh, Gabriel says, and I'm going to tell everybody after I tell you first. So you're going to have to go tell everybody that Jesus is coming and he's going to be in your tummy. Who is this king of glory? Of course, he's talked about his king and Messiah in Matthew's gospel. He is recognized as the suffering servant in Mark's gospel. He's recognized as the Son of Man in Luke's. He is the Savior. He is God who is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. That's what his name means. God, remember what he did. He imputed the guilt of Adam's sin to us, our lost state. So I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes of background. This is what's going on here. Say, we're just going to read a little bit about this stuff and that stuff. And I know that's historically. There's so much beautiful stuff here theologically. There's so much doctrine here. There's so much personal application here in the historical account of Gabriel showing up to Mary. And since God has imputed the guilt of Adam's sin to us, our lost state, Jesus had to be the sinless man to undo Adam's curse. Because Adam's curse is upon us. Remember that first Adam, he failed. He failed in life. He failed so much so that he put us in a place of sin and death. That was the first Adam. The last Adam, as Paul the Apostle refers to Jesus Christ, he completely succeeded. The second Adam, the last Adam, he saved the race from sin. If you will believe on him, that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He brought salvation. As God imputed the guilt of Adam's sin to us, he sent his son Jesus so that he would take all of that sin and then we could have our righteousness be made by Jesus. God says, I have imputed my righteousness upon you through the son, Jesus Christ. The imputation of sin and guilt is erased by the imputation of righteousness and forgiveness and redemption. To impute something is to take into account, to put among, to reckon or to count to. So my account, your account, believer, is flushed. It's taken care of. It is redeemed. And so God says in my son, Jesus Christ, the sinless one, he's the one that's going to erase Adam's curse. That's what's going on here. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Don't forget that wonderful passage in 2 Corinthians includes those verses. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It talks about being reconciled to him. It talks about bringing people to be reconciled to him. Make hope known. Some people feel like they can never be forgiven. In fact, one of the biggest reasons I've ever, ever had that is the roadblock to people that I've known that that would not get saved. I am just not good enough. I am just, I am, you have no idea how rotten of a sinner I am. That's okay. And someone would hold on to that as a reason not to trust in Jesus Christ who knew no sin. And know by faith that God's righteousness will be imputed upon you in that faith moment. In his perfect manner, God implanted his divine life into his created vessel, Mary, to birth the Son of God and man. Think about that. God was Jesus' father, a direct descendant of God, the head of this new race of people called born-again believers, the children of God. In his perfect manner, again, 
God implanted his divine life into a created being named Mary. I can't get over that. I mention it every once in a while when I preach through something like this, maybe Christmas time or Easter time, and he had to be birthed as the Son of God and the Son of Man. It says in Galatians 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman and made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Our complete lineage, our complete inheritance is changed at the moment of salvation. I know that, Pastor. Well, I'm giving just a little bit of background before we read these 12, 13 verses and just make a couple comments because sometimes we overlook so much that's going on in Scripture until we really take an extra glance at it. You see, Gabriel, which means man of God, appears to Mary with the birth announcement that would change the course of history. It changed the course of history. In this setting right here for these few verses, we see some things about Mary, about Gabriel. We see some things about what the Holy Spirit of God does. And of course, God himself. What a birth announcement we are going to read right here. By the way, all of you moms and dads that have birth announcements, when that baby was born, woohoo! please send your checks for the college fund as soon as possible. <clears throat> that wasn't included in Gabriel's birth announcement. Jesus didn't have to go to college. I think he had some divine, you know, intelligence. Let's read this passage of scripture here together. Verses 26 down through 38. We ended last week on verse 25. Here we pick it up. Let's read the scriptures. Be attentive to what God is showing us today. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. The sixth month is referencing the lady in verses number 24 and 25, Elizabeth. Verse number 27, consider this, that Gabriel the angel shows up at this lady's life, a poor handmaid in a city, or excuse me, a town, a rural town named Nazareth. At the time it is said there may have been a hundred 150, 200 people at the most in Nazareth. And it wasn't looked at as a nice town as much as it was as some of the Judean people would say, eh, those people over there in Nazareth of Galilee, eh, they hang out with the Gentiles. They're not really as clean and pure. Watch this here. How Gabriel appears to this woman. And again, just a fresh look here. He appears in verse number 27, it says, to a virgin espoused to be a man whose name, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Keep in mind when you're espoused, that is a contract that cannot be broken. It's as if they're married already, but they have not consummated the marriage. And so, in the heritage of God's way with the people, the Jewish people, they were contracted between the two families to be together. And then the day would come, and it would be within a year of that agreement. Usually it was predicated on Joseph or whoever the husband was to find a good job to be able to provide for the wife. Then the agreement was made that they would have the ceremony, and then the consummation would come, and the marriage would be complete. To be espoused meant, hey, we're in together. We're, we're in. So keep that in mind in the tradition of the time and understand it's not just hey how big of an engagement ring did i get let's go look, let's go look for rings oh don't waste that much money you're going to need money to take care of her the engagement ring will be the cheapest thing you'll buy there buddy right ty don't don't answer it don't answer it you're wise you've been married a few years good job we continue. Here we go. Let's get a little flow going on verse number 28. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. 
28. And the angel came unto her, and here he now starts speaking. Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Three incredibly powerful statements of the angel speaking on behalf of God as his messenger. Verse 29. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this, might, this should be. Cast in her mind means very simply, like anybody, I'm, she's thinking about it. She's got different thoughts. It's not like she's confused or saying, oh gosh, I'm against it, but rather, what does this mean? Cast in her mind. Verse number 30, the angel said unto her, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. It's beautiful because verse 28 says, thou art highly favored. Verse 30 says, don't fear, thou hast found favor with God. Verse 31, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. And here comes the, the big news. And bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Any time that the capital letters are spoken of a name, like in the Lord in the Old Testament, is referencing deity. That is deity. That's Jesus. He is God. And of course, the name means God is salvation. By the way, Jesus' name is almost a thousand times mentioned just in your New Testament. The name of Jesus. Keep in mind, everyone, that this name Jesus that we so oftentimes maybe just lightly reference today, just for a couple minutes, realize that this woman is being announced to have a baby and is going to, she's going to call his name Jesus. And keep in mind, she knows the Old Testament. She knows that she's a godly woman. She doesn't know that it's going to be her that's going to be the one. But she finds out that she's going to be the one. Verse 32, he shall be great, shall be called the son of the highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. He's going to fulfill everything that was promised to David because that was a forerunner. He was a forerunner of Jesus to come. Verse 34, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Wow. And behold, thy cousin, Elizabeth, she also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Sounds like someone named Hannah, doesn't it? For with God, nothing shall be impossible, verse number 37 says. And Mary's response, and Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Any of you ladies that have been pregnant and given birth, is that a pretty good announcement? You think that's pretty, pretty big? You think that maybe you having your first baby, woohoo! This was big. And that's why I use this simple title What a Birth Announcement. What a birth announcement this is. Now, just over the next few minutes, just, just a couple of simple things that I know, as I always do, just to try to find a way that this fits for us. So the Holy Spirit directing us, the Word of God. Let's let the Word of God speak. Again, I mentioned earlier, four different people that are involved here in this setting. I like using that method sometimes just to, just to break something down. Of course, we can't leave out God, so let's start with Him. First off, it says up on the screen this. This birth announcement proves the importance of God's manner. Where did you get that from? Well, God has a method or a manner of doing things. And this proves the importance of God's manner that Mary would give a receptive response. God already knows how she's going to receive this. She's going to be receptive. But in this setting here, we have to find out, is God truly and completely 
involved in it. Well, absolutely, Pastor. Of course he is. Then this birth announcement proves the importance of God's manner. Again, I mentioned earlier that Judah had a disdain for the Jews that lived in Galilee. That woman would not usually in their place be chosen as the one that would be, hey, this handmaid found favor with God. Blessed, it says there. Blessed art thou among women. It says there, again, that she's espoused to a man. House of David, which covers the lineage stuff easily, both of them we know from Matthew and Luke's gospel. But we do see something in verse number 29, but I don't think it sits there that long. How about you? Verse 29, and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind, I mentioned that earlier, what manner of salutation or greeting or introduction or word this should be. And it sounds like it doesn't last long. To me, God's manner of how he delivered this is really, really important. And he brings his guy. He brings Gabriel, who we have last heard speaking to Daniel, appearing to Daniel. We know that he is really, of course, one of only two named angels. And we find that as God says, hey, this is my manner to speak. I want to let her know. And Mary then, in that sense, gives a receptive response. It could be that Mary is more highly regarded sometimes in some religions than she should be. And then there's others on that complete antithesis going, well, we shouldn't regard her that highly. She's just a woman, of course, in her magnificent statement that says, hey, I just need the Savior too. I need a Savior. I'm a sinner that needs a Savior. And somehow, somewhere... Along that whole gamut, maybe Mary just doesn't get the recognition that she ought to. Maybe it's possible not to raise her, of course, above the God of the universe. Absolutely not. But to realize that God's manner of coming to this woman tells us something very important. And that's that his manner going to her, his way of doing it, his methodology is significantly important because she receives this and gives a positive response. She's receptive. She wants to hear what the angel has to say. She doesn't stop him. Why? Because she's a godly woman hearing from God himself through the messenger. She knows old covenant Jewish theology. She is without question as this angel says and states by Luke's gospel writing that you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed art thou among women. Again, I know that some religions say that Mary's part of the redemptive powers of Jesus and that she's a co-redeemer. You cannot prove that scripturally, though you have to stretch things to do that. And it's just not right. It's Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. But a lot of that is taught. She's more highly regarded that you could pray to Mary and that she could answer prayers for you or divinely go to God. That's tough theology to handle, but on the other hand, please consider that a lot of people believe that. And you have to be sensitive and not just demean Mary and regard her properly, just as the Lord did. The second thing in this birth announcement I see is how Gabriel gets involved, and I've mentioned him a little bit. Gabriel's message. You see, the birth announcement proves the importance of Gabriel's message, that the words of God, God's prophecies are fulfilled. Look, it says it here. Verse number 31, verse number 32, verse number 33. These are prophecies from Isaiah chapter number 9. You guys know the scriptures. This also comes from Daniel. There is prophecy that has been spoken by the prophets that have come aforetime. And it says, hey, there's coming a Savior, a Savior into this world. You've heard these scriptures. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. 
and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government, and peace shall there be no end upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it, establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. There you have it. Verse 32, verse 33. What would it be like if Gabriel spoke things that are not in the Bible? What if Gabriel was using words that were never spoken of before and it was some like contradictory prophecy? Everything would be a mess. But it lines up beautifully and perfectly because it's God's word. It's God's statement. It's God's truth. It's God's prophecy being fulfilled. And Gabriel's message is significant. It says there, again, when he is speaking there, verses 30 through 33, you think, gosh, wow. He is laying it down for her after he tells her, don't fear. Fear not. You found favor. And then I'm going to tell you all that's going to go on. And when you have this son and you call him Jesus and he's going to be great and the son of the highest, whew, that would really be overwhelming, wouldn't it, ladies? If God said, hey, I'm going to use you to house the God of the universe. We know. We've read it. We've talked about it. We've had it in Bible studies. We go through it every year, maybe. We go through Christmas story and stuff. But consider this. Gabriel delivered the truth of Jesus Christ as being fully human and fully deity or divinity. He talked of how he is going to be in your womb. You're going to bring forth a son. So it's going to be birth. he's going to be birthed like anyone else, but he's going to be great. He's going to be son of the highest, the capital H. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign, and he shall reign. So he's going to be the one that fulfills everything that has been promised in the people's minds to David. Remember, David spoke of Jesus Christ continually in the Psalms. He spoke in Messianic Psalms constantly, and so much so that Jesus spoke of how David's statements were as prophetic as any others, like even the words of Moses when it came to speaking of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That leads me to the third thing, speaking about what the Holy Spirit did. This birth announcement proves the importance of Holy Spirit's miracle, that this most special pregnancy be divine. I say this now and then and, and try to push it out there as much as I can. This woman is going to have a pregnancy, of course, in front of people without having fully consummated her marriage. She's espoused. The one that knows it better than anyone is Joseph, as we know. And we have the accounting of Joseph coming, of how he handles this so beautifully. A very special man. But you think right now, Dad, about what it's like to hear from your wife, we're pregnant. And then she cleans it up and says, wait a minute, you're not pregnant, I am pregnant. That works for a few months, and then all of a sudden, now it's, no, we're not pregnant anymore. <laughs> I'm pregnant. But what a thrill for a man to hear that your wife has your baby in her tummy. And in this divine pregnancy, consider, again, as I said earlier, who Jesus is. He is the son of the highest. He is also, as, as Luke says here, that holy thing. Verse 35. I don't know. The Bible's just interesting, so much so. It makes you kind of chuckle a little. Therefore, also that holy thing, I would not call Jesus a holy thing when I see him. But Luke is using Holy Spirit language here. And it's in God's word. That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Holy 
He cannot be, again, as I said earlier, of Adam's DNA. Because that would be imperfect. He is of God's DNA. It's Holy Spirit divinely impregnating this woman named Mary. And Gabriel clearly says, hey, this baby, to be a holy thing, to be the holy thing, it's not going to have this sinful human nature, but it will have the flesh that has the propensity to sin. Wow. Wow, don't forget that. That's what Hebrews tells us. Tempted in all points. But it's perfect. He is perfect. The only one to that point, and no one ever since. No one before him, and no one after him. He is the last Adam, and he is the Holy Spirit's miracle. Please consider this as the Holy Spirit (coughs) is the one inside of you, believer. (coughs) Just a quick interruption. Sinus infections are great, aren't they? <laughs> Dwayne, is, Dwayne is mentoring me. I can't even get to his level. He's like on the 47th level of... But I love how he handles it, so i got to keep on going. Can I... I'm, no more whining. Okay, let's back, back to the text. Back to the text. We're talking about Jesus being divinely put into Mary's womb. And I consider this right now as you and I as believers have the Holy Spirit in us and we discount him sometimes. We don't listen to his teaching. When he teaches us the Bible, we're listening to some other teaching. Or he's teaching us great conviction and we go, I don't know if I like that today. Well, he's convicting me of some sin and some emptiness and some fault. He's convicting me of some places where I need to let go of this and put on this. I need to put on Jesus more. more. I just need to, I need to grab the whole armor of God. And the Holy Spirit's doing that to me, and I'm, I'm, I'm quieting them down. Please, Holy Spirit, be quiet. Word of God, please be quiet. This is the Holy Spirit of God come into this woman's created being by God. And she now becomes what? The host of the Holy of Holies. He is the high priest growing inside of her womb. He is the Messiah growing in her womb. He is the king growing in her womb. Any of you moms ever had baby? We can't even touch that with you. And then you can't even touch this. It is a most special pregnancy. And it is divine. And Gabriel communicates to her clearly. Hey, fear not. It's a Holy Spirit miracle coming. He's going to be... This holy thing in you. And I want you to know, by the way, in verse 36, that your cousin, she's conceived in her old age. God is doing miracle after miracle after miracle. The thing is, that is a progenitor situation where dad was used by God in the miracle. This time, there was no dad involved but Father God. He's the dad. That's divine. That's powerful. That's incredible. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Last thought. This birth announcement proves the importance of Mary's mind. This won't take long, but you'll see her mind. You know. You know who she is. This is going to lead into our finish up and our our invitation time and going into praying for the children and having our baby dedication. Consider Mary's mind. This birth announcement proves the importance of Mary's mind that revealed her humble and willing heart and willing spirit. She had such a spirit 
of reverence unto God. That What does she say in verse 38? What does she call herself? Handmaid, right? Just simply a handmaid. The lowest office that you can garner as a servant. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. I will be unto the Lord for the rest of my life. I will be betrothed to the Lord. I will be in subjection to him. I will be in submission to him. I will be completely surrendered to him. This is this woman's spirit. This is this woman's heart. Be it unto me according to thy word. Look at that second half of this. She's saying, I will do all that your will directs me to do. And the angel departed. She states who she is back to the angel as she's stating it to God himself. I am humbled that I am as a handmaid unto you, whatever. I'm in that state. That is my calling, period. And then she says something that may be contrary to many of us when we pray. She says, your will. Your will. Your will. Do we pray like that? Do we speak that way? She says, be it unto me according to thy word. Do whatever you want unto me according to your word. Whatever. Be it unto me. I'm the handmaid. I'm not asking for nothing. But be it unto me. According to your word. As you spoke earlier by Gabriel. That there would be a divine pregnancy. And that I would give birth to a son. This woman's mind is incredible. Mary's mind tells you all about what's going on in here. She has a humble spirit. She has a surrendered spirit. She has a willing spirit. You listen to a young 18-year-old man say the same thing. Two years ago, I met a guy named Steve Kern. Last summer, I went on a mission trip to Mexico City. I've been praying and seeing what God would do the winter of 2022 into 2023. Okay, I'll go. I, I, okay. But that's been spending time alone with God in summer camps, winter camps, discipleship mentoring time in the word of god together on his own that's all mary is the same as you and me what would it be like if god spoke to you through his word because he does it all the time what do you do with all of that when he does so that leads to our invitation as it comes to our time of dedicating our babies as much as the birth announcement is about jesus christ and we know that we see god at work in two parents <laughs> Very simply, as we look at this and finish up, on this Father's Day, we as parents need to dig deep and ask ourselves, what does it take to raise godly children? And are we willing and committed to do so? Why don't you go ahead and bow for a word of prayer before we bring some babies up? In fact, why don't you go ahead and stand? Those that have babies can sit. You can do whatever you want. Your moms, you can do anything you want. Dads, it's Father's Day. It's the only day you can do whatever you want. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Why don't you bow your heads and consider this prayer. The music's playing in background. Kind of a short invitation time, but I want you to spend some time in prayer here. What does it take to raise godly children? And are we willing and committed to do so? Our Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful morning. We've already listened to a young man speak about his willingness and his submission to you. But most of all, I look in your word right now again, and I thank you for the time in your word. I thank you, God, that your word is spoken to us on behalf of and from the accounting of Gabriel speaking to Mary. Thank you for showing us that this incredible birth announcement comes to fruition in reality today when we think of the babies that have been born in this small little church out here in Blue Springs over the last number of years. I thank you 
for all these little babies. And I think of all the babies of all these moms and dads here in this church, this family, and how we just had a family conference five weeks ago speaking of the similar matter of raising our children in the nurture and admission of the Lord. I pray this morning that this would be a time that's pleasing to you, but most of all that, God, we would listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit who divinely met Mary to put inside her the divine one, Jesus, who then came, walked a sinless, perfect life, went to the cross, shed his blood, was raised on the third day for our salvation. I can't thank you enough, holy God. And again, God, as we dedicate these children, I pray that you will cover them, watch over them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.